Clive left England in 1743, and after a delay of nine months in the Brazils, reached Madras towards the end of 1744. The enforced detention that would enable him to learn Portuguese was unfortunate, for he found on landing that the gentleman to whom he had been given letters of introduction had left for England. For some little time, he was without money and without friends, and he appears to have felt his position acutely. His early letters to his relations, while they show a warm affectionate heart, are despondent in tone, and display a distrust of his own powers remarkable in one who is to give such early proof of indomitable will. He was dissatisfied and begged his father to get him transferred to Bengal, or promoted to the rank of factor. I don't doubt, he says, but you'll make use of all possible means for my advancement. The world seems to be greatly debased of late, and interest carries it entirely before merit, especially in this service, though I should think myself very undeserving were I only to build my foundation on the strength of the former. To a cousin, he writes that the intemperance of the climate, together with the excessive heat of the sun, are very noxious to our health, and I really think the advantages which accrue to us here are greatly overbalanced by the sacrifices we make of our constitutions. I have not been unacquainted with the fickleness of fortune, and may safely say I have not enjoyed one happy day since I left my native country. I am not acquainted with any one family in the place, and have not assurance enough to introduce myself without being asked. After his arrival in India, Clive was fortunate enough to obtain access to an excellent library in Government House, and he must have made good use of the opportunity. There is no record of the manner in which he fitted himself for his work in life, but before Madras surrendered, he seems to have made himself a fair Latin scholar, and to have acquired that intimate acquaintance with the politics and character of the natives which contributed so largely to his successful career. His strong, decided character is said to have rendered his appointment as troublesome to his superiors as it was irksome to himself, and his abhorrence of compulsion is amusingly illustrated by his reply to an invitation from the governor's secretary, to whom he had been ordered to apologize. No, sir, the governor did not command me to dine with you. Yet when he obtained a commission, he never complained of military discipline and never grew impatient under its yoke. During this period, he is said either in a fit of despair or of low spirits to have attempted suicide. A companion, coming into his room on one occasion, was requested to take up a pistol and fire it out the window. He did so, whereupon Clive, who was in one of his gloomy moods, sprang up and exclaimed, Well, I am reserved for something. I have twice snapped that pistol at my own head. The disgraceful surrender of Madras to the French and the infraction of the terms of the capitulation by Duplay mark a turning point in Clive's career. The proud spirit of the young civilian could ill bear the humiliating position at Madras. He disguised himself in native attire and fled with Edmund Maskelyne, his future brother-in-law, to Fort St. David, where the British flag still waved over men determined to uphold the honor of their country. Soon after his arrival at the fort, he fought a duel with one of two ensigns in the company's service, who had been detected cheating at cards. He had lost, and, in refusing to pay, passed some strong remarks on the conduct of the officer, who at once called him out. Clive fired and missed his opponent, who, walking up to him, held the pistol to his head and bade him ask for his life. After some hesitation, he complied, but when further pressed to withdraw his remarks and promise payment, he replied, Fire and be dead. I said you cheated. I say so still, and I will never pay you. The astonished ensign, finding threats useless, called him a madman and flung his pistol away. When Clive's friends complimented him on his behavior, he generously remarked, The man has given me my life. And though I will never pay him nor associate with him again, I have no right in future to mention his behavior at the card table. Clive was at Fort St. David when the French made their three abortive attempts upon the place during the winter of 1746-47, to and though his name is not mentioned in connection with military affairs, he no doubt took his turn of duty with the rest of the garrison and was a keen, observant spectator of all that passed. The liability of the French troops to panic, the native dread of well-served artillery, the ease with which a small disciplined force could keep a native army in check were lessons not to be lightly forgotten. It was a time when a writer in the company's service had little to do, and it is not surprising that a man of Clive's energetic temperament should have elected to enter the army. In 1747, he asked for and obtained a commission as ensign, and in the following year, he showed, at the Siege of Pondicherry, some of those soldierly qualities which, in after years, won for him the admiration and confidence of the troops. 
Upon one occasion, whilst the French were making a vigorous sortie, he ran back from the advanced trench to bring up powder to the battery in which he was serving. The incident gave rise to a remark that he had quitted his post from fear. Clive, on hearing what had been said, went with a friend to the officer who had made the remark and insisted upon instant satisfaction. As they were retiring to settle the dispute, the officer who was following struck him on the ear. He at once drew, and his example was followed by his opponent. But before they had crossed swords, they were separated. A court of inquiry was held, and the officer who had defamed Clive was ordered to beg his pardon at the head of the battalion. The court, however, unwilling to break him, took no notice of the blow. After the siege had been raised, and the troops had retired upon Fort St. David, Clive demanded satisfaction for this last insult, and when it was refused, he laid his cane on the officer's head and told him he could not think of thrashing such a contemptible coward. The next day, the officer resigned his commission. In these early incidents of his career, Clive never appears as the aggressor. He expresses his opinion firmly and decidedly, and he is ever ready to resent an insult, but he never seeks a quarrel. If he had possessed the turbulent disposition with which he has been credited, he would, in an age when dueling prevailed, have degenerated into a bully. The haughty reserve of his manner was ill-calculated to make him popular with the young writers and ensigns who were his daily companions, and with whom there must have been frequent sources of quarrel. Yet his worst enemies were unable to bring forward in any anecdote to his dishonor or discredit. He was soon to give proof of the high qualities that he possessed. When hostilities ceased in December 1748, England and France had an unusual number of troops in India, whose presence was the source of considerable anxiety to the local governors. It was impossible for either nation to disband before the arrival of definite news that peace had been concluded, and it was at the same time necessary to find employment and sustenance for the soldiers. Each side, partly from motives of economy, partly from a desire to gain some material advantage, resolved to employ its troops as mercenaries in the quarrels of the native princes. The adoption of this policy, which Duplay justifies in a remarkable letter to the French company, marks a turning point in the history of India. In carrying it out, the English acted with great indiscretion, the French with the utmost ambition. The first venture of the English was in favor of a native prince, Saiji who some years previously had been compelled to vacate the throne of Tanjore in favor of his brother Pertab Singh. He had been much impressed by the ease with which the disciplined troops of Paradis had defeated Mahfuz Khan and determined to solicit European assistance in an attempt to regain his throne. An old quarrel with the French, having rendered the success of an appeal to Duplay doubtful, Saiji applied to the English and offered, if they would restore him, to cede Devakata and pay the cost of the war. Devakata, near the mouth of the coal run, was the chief outlet for the trade of a rich district, sometimes called the Garden of Southern India, and immediate advantages would result from its possession. The English, still smarting under the loss of Madras and a humiliating retreat from Pondicherry, were unable to resist the temptation and espouse the cause of Saiji. A first attempt to take Devakata in April 1749 failed. Captain Cope, who commanded the British force, found the ramparts manned by innumerable troops, and though urged by Clive to blow the gates open and deliver an assault, retired to Fort St. David. A second expedition under Major Stringer Lawrence was more successful. Devakata was taken, and the Tanjore army was afterwards sharply repulsed in an attempt to capture the pagoda of Achaviram, which the English had occupied. At this moment, the Raja heard of the defeat and death of the Nawab of the Carnatic and hastened to conclude peace. During the second attack on Devakata, Clive, who led the forlorn hope, behaved with great gallantry. Advancing with 34 Europeans and 700 sepoys, he had some difficulty in crossing a rivulet under a smart fire from the fort. The sepoys hesitated and held back while Clive and the Europeans pushed on to the foot of the breach, where they were suddenly charged by a party of Tanjore horse. So impetuous was the attack that 26 men were cut down in a moment, and Clive himself narrowly escaped, being sabred. At the close of the operations, Clive, through the influence of Lawrence, was appointed commissary to the British troops. He had, however, scarcely taken over his duties when he was prostrated by a severe attack of fever accompanied by a hard swelling at the pit of the stomach, which so affected his spirits that the constant presence of an attendant was absolutely necessary. On the subsidence of the fever, he went to Bengal for change of air and returned with much improved health. 
but his constitution had been so severely shaken that during the remainder of his life, excepting when his mind was ardently engaged, the oppression on his spirits frequently returned. 